Bonjour, je suis Sylvain Gillier et je voulais vous souhaiter la bienvenue pour cette édition 2023 du Sommet en ligne Chevaux Médiateurs, Chevaux Guérisseurs. À plus de 1 millier d'inscriptions pour notre édition 2023 du Sommet en ligne, une vingtaine d'intervenantes et d'intervenants pour témoigner de la diversité du panorama de la médiation avec les chevaux et donc trois journées d'interview euh, les 12, 13, 14 décembre en soirée, euh, mardi, mercredi, jeudi, vous avez la possibilité d'échanger en direct avec les intervenantes et les intervenants. Ce sommet, il a été réalisé entièrement par une équipe de bénévoles. Il est diffusé entièrement gratuitement. Ça fait plusieurs centaines d'heures de travail. Alors, si vous souhaitiez soutenir notre travail, les projets de cheval en conscience, les chevaux médiateurs, les chevaux guérisseurs, euh, eh bien, il y a une possibilité de donner à l'association Cheval Communication sur le lien et l'OASO. Et donc, aujourd'hui, nous sommes mercredi 13 décembre et donc deuxième jour de ce sommet en ligne. Et aujourd'hui, on voudrait répondre à cette question. Le cheval, est-ce que c'est pour se reconnecter à la nature sauvage, à la nature sauvage des, des chevaux, ou peut-être à soi-même Et donc, pour répondre à cette question, plusieurs intervenantes, Alexandra Bergmans, qui est artiste équestre, Leila Pages, mon amie Rebecca Janson, Aurélie Lecerre, qui nous parlera de sa connexion avec le cheval, Laetitia Toanen et également euh, le docteur Kelsey Dale John, qui est membre enregistré de la Nation Navarro, euh, que j'ai interviewé donc, il y a à peu près deux semaines chez elle en Arizona, et qui nous parlera de la connexion traditionnelle avec les chevaux et les peuples amérindiens Navarro en Arizona aux états unis Hello, Kelsey. So it's uh, such an honor to have you at this uh, online summit about uh, healing and reconnecting with the uh, horses. And um, we are here um, at your at your place in Arizona. Um, and um, um, could you uh, tell us uh, in a few words who, who you are and uh, how did you met uh, horses and why they are important for you? Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name is Kelsey Dale John, and um, I am a member of the Navajo Nation. I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Um, I grew up in the state of Oklahoma, and uh, I went to school in upstate New York, and I studied education. And so um, I actually have been around horses my entire life. I come from a horse family on, on both sides. My mother and my father both came from horse cultures um, and have, have had that in their backgrounds for a number of years. And so um, I was just born into relationship with horses, basically. Um, and so I actually was put on a horse when I was quite young with my mom as a baby. And um, so I kind of was just always around horses, they were always there to me. So there's actually no moment in my life where I remember meeting horses for the first time or even really becoming aware of their presence because they were just always, um, they were always there. <laughs> so I've definitely been like born into the, the horse relationship world and um, grew up with horses and mostly I just had relationships with them more than mm -hmm. any other kind of discipline. I didn't do anything competitive with horses. Um, we did ride our horses and trail ride quite a bit. Um, and my dad trained um, our own horses. So I kind of became interested in training through that um, perspective. But I became interested in horses as a form of education when I was in graduate school. And the reason why is because I was very dissatisfied with the current educational system, especially as it 
as it doesn't necessarily support Native American people. And so because of that, I began to think about areas of my life where I had gained a lot of education or had learned a lot. And I kept thinking back to this really long um, familial and childhood relationship with horses. That's kind of where I thought, when I thought to myself, where did I learn the most? It was in those relationships um, with horses, so, but with other animals too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what kind of uh, education did, did you have with horses and other animals? What was, was it some, something formal or? No, it was informal. Um, it was very much like how people would describe experiential or kind of a family-based education. Um, and it was very relational. It was more like you are, as a Navajo person, supposed to be in relationship with horses. Mm -hmm. And so then you are, and you share space with them. Um, you know, you grow up with them. Some people work, work with their horses for, mm -hmm. for ranching, for working purposes. So the, the relationship is very close and very intertwined. And so you learn a lot from that closeness and that relationality. So I would say that was the system, um, as well as just sort of being thrown into, into situations and watching people who had the expertise and then trying to model what they were doing. And in that atmosphere, it was my parents. All right, okay. And um, after this uh, education by, by observation, then um, I understand you've been doing research also in, in this field with, with horses and, uh, and with the um, relationship with horses. And could you please talk, explain a little bit what kind of research you've been doing? Yeah. So I became um, aware as a, as a scholar of the vast field of equine facilitated and assisted services. Um, and so when I began to explore that world, it was really useful for me because it began to operationalize and add a framework to this relational learning that I had personally experienced. And my initial research was actually about horse-human relationships within the Navajo culture. And so I was already exploring horse-human relationships as a form of education. Um, and then I became more aware that people were using horses um, within different modalities for different kinds of equine assisted services. And so, um, so I became really interested in that field over time. And my current research is um, I'm working with a team of folks at um, one, one is at Purdue, Leanne Nyforth, and Aviva Vincent, who's at Cleveland State. And our research team is looking at um, diversity within the equine assisted services world. And even more specifically, we're looking at curriculum and how curriculum and training for equine assisted services um, contributes to or doesn't to um, diversity. So we're, we're trying to better understand it's a very beginning of the study. We're trying to understand, um, you know, what affects people's access and also the lack of diversity within the equine world. Um, there's really, again, there's not enough, there's not a lot of research on that. So we're approaching the problem from a very small standpoint um, and hope to grow that project over time. So we're very interested in that. And we're also interested in how people of different positionalities, identities, genders, races, um, any form of, of, of identity and, and kind of location, structural location, how they approach and practice equine assisted services differently. Mm -hmm. So I would say the basis of our research is that we very much believe that people's cultural views or their position in society affects the way that they do the work. So we're trying to better understand what those um, influences are and how they enter into the work. I heard from um, indigenous people that the horse might help to uh, um, reappropriate the, the culture. Do you think this is 
this is true and is it a, a result of your research or um, so currently I'm not doing any research with 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 tribal folks but in my past okay. research um, I would say that yes uh, for for that it was very meaningful to people to continue on their cultural traditions mm -hmm. in regard to the horses and so um, Yes, I would say that it, it is important, especially for any tribes that are horse tribes that have those deep, you know, beliefs and traditions. And it's just another part of the, the culture and also the lived reality. I mean, that's why I live my life with horses. It's a deeply cultural belief. It's a it's a part of my like belief system of what it means to be um, what it means to be an indigenous person and in particular a Navajo person is to be with horses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, uh, you, I've, I've met your horse, Bambi, uh, before, which is um, a Mustang uh, that was uh, rescued. Uh, and um, how, how did that relationship build for you and what, what did you what did you experience while building this relationship with the, your horse? Yeah, so I um, was volunteering at a rescue in New Mexico called Four Corners Equine Rescue. And I was living in the area at the time, so I, I didn't have um, access to my own horses. And my, my parents, you know, lived far away. So I decided to volunteer um, at a rescue because I just missed being around horses. And so that's where I met Bambi and um, our relationship we've I was just thinking we've been together for five years and it's been very educational <laughs> um, I think the biggest one of the biggest things that I've, I've learned from her that was also influenced by my my cultural background is is just that everything that you do in the presence of a horse really matters um, and even what you're doing away from them matters to that relationship because she is, as you saw, a very sensitive horse. Yes. And so because of that, that's her greatest strength. That's like her greatest superpower is, is being able to be so aware of her surroundings and so um, sensitive to everything. So that helped me look at the world in a different way. And it was mostly out of like love for her because I didn't want to upset her or confuse her as she made the transition from Mustang to domesticated setting. I could see that that transition was hard for her and I knew that it was. And so because of that, we just took a long time to, to work on all kinds of very basic things. Um, and I took a very long time to build a relationship with her and I was just thinking about it today. Um, one of the things that I did with her the most was just like sit there with her, like just spend a lot of time just doing nothing, s sitting there with her and just being being there and being present. Um, and so she's, she's probably the horse that's taught me the most and has changed my outlook on, um, on what, what it means to have a relationship with a horse, what it means to train a horse, all of these things. And I think I actually credit her to me even going into more of, of an exploration um, f around, you know, equitation and equine sciences and like a lot of what we're learning now on the scientific side about what's best for horses, what's best for training them, how to care for them, how they do in equine assisted work you know all of these questions I think were originally prompted by her because it just really changed the way that I, I understood horse human relationships oh, okay thank you and, and so, so it took uh, some time and, yes. uh, and, and she's such a sweet horse now mm -hmm. very sensitive and, and very calm too and, um, and so, do you think for equine facilitated learning or therapy, um, do you think that any horse would, would fit or there would be a, some special horses? Should, should it be Mustangs or what, what kind of uh, 
preparation you think would be um, adequate for, for this kind of work? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've heard different opinions about this, especially from the scientific community, which I really respect. And I think it depends on the kind of equine facilitated work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that you can do equine facilitated work from a distance. Like, I believe that you can do it by simply watching horses in a pasture and and sitting with yourself and your and your thoughts and examining, you know, what what you're thinking and, and what that relationship is. Um, and there are also folks who do mounted work, right? It can go a whole spectrum. So I think that the type of work probably depends on the type of the horse. And I'm sure that there are certain horses that don't want to do any type of facilitated work. So I think in the same way that we're very um, observant and, and, and careful and um, intentional about how we choose horses for different disciplinary work, it's the same with the facilitated work as well. I think horses have mm -hmm. personalities and they have likes and dislikes. They have sets of training. You know, obviously I don't think it's a good idea to take a Mustang into an arena and do something with like cones and a ball and balloons and you know some stuff that folks do for equine facilitated work. Mm -hmm. um, it's I think in that in that aspect it would be unkind to expose a mustang to a bunch of objects that they haven't maybe seen before. So I think you have to gauge, and that's where I believe that having a good foundation of equine behavior and knowing what you're seeing is really important for judging which horses can do which kind of, of work. So you wanna make sure that that horse is in a comfortable state. So if they're in a comfortable state doing the work and they're able to do it, I think that's that's a good sign. Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on the work. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. that like any kind of horse can or can't do it. And I also wouldn't say that Mustangs can or should do it, or that they shouldn't either. I think it really depends on okay. on the horse. So yeah. again, uh, observation is is uh, important yeah. here. It's really important. Yeah, mm. I feel like that's maybe one skill that I picked up from my family, because again, I've shared space with horses basically my whole life. Mm. So one thing that I have. Um, that a lot of people have who've shared space with horses is basically a lifetime of watching and observing them and yes. watching and observing them in a fairly natural habitat because of the way that we manage our horses. Um, and so because of that, I feel like I've learned so much about what they like, what they don't like, um, you know, how they interact when they're, when they're okay, when they're not okay, that like, you just start to build those skills over time. And that's actually what a lot of scientific studies are based off of is observation, observation of wild herds, observation of you know horses that they're studying. Yes. And so I think it's a good skill for anyone who does work with horses to really just spend time watching and learning and understanding and um, becoming familiar. Yes, absolutely. We had an, an interview with uh, Hélène Roche, which is a French, um, scientific specialist of uh, observation of horses and that's pretty much what she says science is, is based on observation actually mm -hmm. yeah, so thank you so much uh, Kelsey and uh, and is there something that you learned with with your horses and, and uh, in the in the, the nature that um, that you use in your everyday life in your professional life and, and what what which would it be? Yeah, I think, I mean, so much because I think I'm always making the connection between who I am with my horses and who I am professionally or, you know, as a family member, you know, as a friend. Um, to me, there's not a whole lot of separation. It's like who you are in the world is who you are with your horses. And so um, I'm constantly making those connections. And it just depends on, like, the day or the interaction with the horse, but I think with the two that live with us now, um, from Bambi, I've really learned that like everything matters and to really just like protect the kind of like peacefulness of, of life. Like she's very good at just like 
being calm. And so I've seen how she like arranges herself to be calm. And so I've learned a lot from her about that. Um, our other horse who's a gelding is a little bit harder to handle. And so from him, I feel like I've learned how to have a little more energy and a little more um, boundaries and, and clarity in what I do um, because of his personality. So from both of them, I've, I've learned, um, you know, skills. And I think too, just like relationally, it's so important to build a relationship um, with anyone, especially if you're going to be an educator. I think you can't train a horse very well if you don't have a relationship with them. And it's the same thing with, you know, my students. I can't really train them very well on how to do graduate level research if we have, if we don't have a relationship. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the horse is a, is a teacher also, uh, learns how, us how to how to understand things. So, that's it. Thank you so much for this interview. And uh, maybe to conclude, um, is there uh, somewhere where a place where we could uh, read more about your ongoing research and, um, and and when it will be published? Will it be with the University of Arizona or? Yeah. So um, I'm happy to share um, our our article once we do conclude our, our study and, and submit it for publication. Um, there's a few articles already out there that I, they're not all in one place. I don't have a website. I should, um, but I can, I'm happy to share them with you. Some of my current writing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.